Hello and welcome to Growing Through Connection, a podcast that explores the life-changing impact of emotionally focused therapy. Join us as we discover how EFT helps create and secure lasting connections, leading to more fulfilling lives. In this special first season, we offer a series of short conversations with the late Dr. Sue Johnson, the pioneering visionary behind EFT. Sue shares her personal journey, reflects on the evolution of her work, and offers powerful insights into the science of emotional connection. So settle in and enjoy this unique opportunity to get to know Sue while discovering how EFT can deepen your relationships and enrich your life in ways you'd never imagined. Sue, a lot of work goes into all your research, your books, your presentations. You do a lot of reading. What do you read to unwind that's non-therapy related? Well, I love history. I'm particularly fascinated by women in history. And I'm particularly fascinated, perhaps because of my background, about women in the Second World War. So I'm a complete sucker to, for any novel that's about the women that were parachuted into France, for example, to become spies and wireless operators. And most of those women were incredibly brave. At least a quarter of them were killed. At one point, the life expectancy of a female uh, operator from England who was dropped into France was six weeks. Some of those women became leaders of the resistance. Some of those women, there was one woman, I can't remember her name, who ended up having leading 3,000 um, resistance fighters and taking on uh, regular German troops. Those women were incredibly brave. Of course, as soon as the war ended, they were non-combatants, don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were, they gave one of those women a civilian prize and she sent it back and said, I was never civil in the war in my life. <laughs> I, in fact, I shot people, but you don't want to know that. So I'm fascinated by women in history, women in the Second World War. There's a, an author called Kate Quinn, writes books like The Rose Code about the women at Betchley who, who you know, figured out all the codes that the German submarines were using. Ordinary women, typists, hairdressers, you know, ended up there and they, they learned how to do these codes. There's a, they, she wrote a book called The Huntress, which has a woman in it who was one of the bomber pilots. Stalin created three battalions of women bomber pilots. Of course, after the war, he forgot he did that. He didn't actually do that, you know. But these women, young RAF pilots in the middle of the Battle of Britain were allowed to fly 25 sorties before they had a break. These women used to fly 80 sorties a night in tiny little canvas planes with bombs attached under their wings. The Germans used to call them the night witches. So there's women in that book called The Huntress and her latest one is called Diamond Eye. And she bases it on history, but then she makes it fiction. So I like that stuff. And I like one of my favorite trilogies, biographies, is The Last Lion about a Winston Churchill, who I think is one of the most fascinating, fascinating characters in history. And, you know, if you read the beginning of his life, he had, uh, from an attachment theorist point of view, I don't know how he survived, he was sent to English boarding school. He, he had a totally distant, indifferent mother who was the king's mistress at one point, I think, and was just interested in the clothes she was going to wear. And his father was hostile and rigid, and I don't know how he survived this young man, but he did. He went off to the Boer War. He always took incredible risks. He jumped from trains. He got captured. He, you know, he was a character. And I just always found him inspiring. And I think he saved Western civilization because there was no logical reason, as Hitler said, there was no logical reason for him not to surrender. For a number of years in the war, England was starving. It didn't, I mean, if, if Hitler had had the courage to just walk across the channel, he would have taken over Europe. But he didn't. 
And the reason he didn't was Churchill. And Churchill tied into the thing we were talking about, the English working class. You put me up against the wall, I'll fight you. Whether I lose or win, doesn't matter. I'll fight you. And, and you know, Winnie, all the working class people called him, would go up in the middle of the Blitz and stand on the highest building, government building in London, and watch the Blitz. And all the people who were trying to protect him would go berserk, right? And that's what he'd do. And Winnie would get into a freezing cold English bomber plane and fly miles and miles and miles in the middle of wartime across an ocean to talk to Roosevelt in America. Um, he was a fascinating man. The first time he met Roosevelt, um, Roosevelt came to his door. Roosevelt was in a wheelchair. So he knocked on the door. Well, Winston Churchill was having a bath. Winston Churchill had a bath every day, okay? <laughs> that was one of his rules. So he was in the bath. So apparently he got out of the bath and walked to the door naked. <laughs> and opened the door and said to the American president, oh, hi. <laughs> if you can imagine. And he was probably smoking a big cigar at the same time, right? Because he drank and smoked continually, right? And I can't imagine Roosevelt must have thought the English are very, very, very eccentric. He was a strange mixture. He was an artist. He loved building walls. He was a bricklayer. He was probably a terrible father, for what I can gather. He adored his wife. And the book is called The Last Lion. It's by a man called Manchester, I think. And it's wonderful. So that's a great book. And I keep saying I'm going to go back and read the three of them again. I also like Pema Chodron, who is the abbess, Bud Buddhist abbess of the biggest monastery on the east coast of Canada, and who is beyond delightful. I managed to tune into her very last public presentation that she did last year. I was mesmerized by her. She is this wonderful mixture of Buddhist wisdom, realness, authenticity, grace. <laughs> At one point, people were asking her all these incredible questions about, you know, what do I do with this with my life? What do I do with that? And she, this small little woman started to giggle. And she said, my, my, my. Everybody seems to think I'm really wise and clever here. And I have the answers to all these questions. And she laughed again. She said, my, 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 you're giving me a lot of power. And then she giggles again. And I think, I love this woman. I love this woman for her awareness, for her multi-leveled awareness, for her wisdom, for her realness. So Pema Chodron, who's, I'm a sort of bad Buddhist, right? So I don't like all the, the, the dogma. You know, I hated the dogma of Catholicism when I was growing up, and I, I don't like dogma, no matter what it is, even in psychology. And so a lot of the Buddhist dogma just leaves me cold, but not her. She's fabulous. So those are the things I'm reading. Last book I read that I really loved was Lessons in Chemistry, which is about a woman scientist trying to be a scientist in, I guess it's the 1950s. That's right, yeah. But I remember reading that and I was sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know, this is what happened to me like 20, 30 years later as a woman in England. Like, oh my God, it's the same kind of dialogue. It's the same message. And she has to deal with all this incredible chauvinism. The other thing about that one is I don't, I presume people know that I'm a rabid feminist. So, you know, uh, these days it's hard to know what you are politically. Po the political uh, world just is in chaos. I used to think I was very left-wing. Now I get really confused about what I am. But I know one thing. I'm a rabid, committed, total, extreme feminist. 
I believe that the the history of mankind hinges on whether we educate women and whether they take their place in the world as leaders because they have so much to offer. Not that men don't. My main attachment figures in my life have been men. I like men, but I'm a feminist. And so, you know, that's, I don't even know why I'm telling you. Oh, because of lessons in chemistry. And this is the story of a woman trying to buck the chauvinism, mm -hmm. which I experienced in England again and again and again. It's one of the reasons I came to Canada. I remember ending up in Vancouver and thinking, there's something different here. It is very beautiful. People have enough to eat. I can't see a slum. And oh, men talk to you with respect. Oh, and I remember walking <laughs> on the street going, oh, oh, I like that. Oh, that, that, oh that's all right. That's jolly good. So, yeah, so those are the books that I read, and I, I adore history, but particularly history that where women buck the usual roles and they end up being warriors and standing up for the values that women have that have usually been poo-pooed in a chauvinistic society. Like emotion, you know, emotion-focused therapy. Even in graduate school, I remember this man standing up and saying, you know, emotion is basically for children, and if you're an adult, you control it, and it's unre unreliable, and it takes us over, and we don't understand it, and mental health is about being mental. <laughs> and me, I, I learned anything about keeping my mouth shut from my school. And me standing in the back, I'm saying, excuse me, but I don't believe that for a minute. My fellow students would look at me like, shut up. Like you're, like, you're going to cause trouble again. But I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't listen. I said, I remember saying, I don't believe that for a minute. I grew up in an English pub where I watched all these emotional dramas unfolding. Emotion's the thing that defines everything defines the dance that people do with themselves and with other people. And emotion is not the enemy. In fact, it tells you what matters. And, and then I looked at everybody else's faces. <laughs> I looked at these visiting professors' faces and I thought, okay, shut up now. So I said something about the weather and shut up. But that was typical me. You know, in graduate school, I was on fire. I was a crazy graduate student. It was like I longed for this meal all my life just to study people. And I was given it. And it was like I took twice the number of courses that I needed for my doctorate. I did the most ridiculous research project for my doctorate. <laughs> okay, that I, I mean, when I look at it now, it's ridiculous. If a student had said to me, I'm going to do this, I would have said, no, it'll drive you crazy. You'll go mental. You can't do it. I did it. I did it in seven months. I mean, like, I was on fire and I couldn't keep my mouth shut. You know, I, just, I just had to say, no, I don't see reality that way. I presume that's because when I was growing up, I had a father who allowed me to do that. Thank you for joining us on Growing Through Connection. As we conclude, remember that connection is at the heart of human experience. Keep exploring, keep connecting, and we'll see you next time on Growing Through Connection. This podcast is a production of Sue Johnson. Learn more about EFT at drsuejohnson.com and at the International Center for Excellence in Emotionally Focused Therapy site at iseft.com. To find a qualified emotionally focused therapist in your area, visit icef.com and click on our Find an EFT Therapist directory. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and be sure to tell your friends. Until next time, stay connected.